Friday is Friday. What it means, we're going to have a seminar today and really a very, very special uh, person today. So usually you shouldn't start your dinner with dessert, but today we'll have Emily uh, talking to us and telling us what she has done in the last decade or so. I, I have uh, traveled to Washington so many times and usually it's um, very unpleasant uh, for study section and other things. But uh, there was a one trip I made and uh, Emily just hosted us for dinner and, uh, and of course, Swarup as well. Uh, it was just a phenomenal visit at that time. Emily, this will stay with me forever. So thank you even today, many, many years later. Uh, you have to come that, for dinner again. You have to come for dinner again. Then. <laughs> uh, with that, let's just move on to uh, Elliot. Okay. Good morning, everyone. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Emily Chu. Dr. Chu is the director of the Division of Epidemiology and Clinical Application at the NEI. She received her medical degree and ophthalmology residency training at the University of Toronto. Then she completed her fellowship at the Wilma Eye Institute at Johns Hopkins, and another fellowship at the University of Nijmegen. In 1985, she became an assistant professor in the Department of Ophthalmology at University of Toronto. Afterwards, she joined the clinical trials branch of the NEI. Dr. Chu has investigated age-related macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, and other ocular disease. She has worked extensively in large multi-central clinical trials for example, she was a study chair for a phase three clinical trial, which investigated the effect of lutein, zeaxanthin, and omega-3 as a treatment for AMD. Dr. Chu has published a number of high profile articles, including Science, Nature Medicine, Nature Genetics, New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet and JAMA. And she has published over 300 articles. Today, we are very honored to hear more about her research. So please wel welcome Dr. Chu. Thanks very much, Elliot. <clears throat> and thank you uh, for inviting me to all of these. It's like being with friends and family. It's so nice to, to uh, I, I got on this morning to, to check out my, my PowerPoint and there was Chris with his jamming with his rock and roll. So it was really fun to hear all that. So, but thank you very much for having me. I'm gonna talk about a 10 year update for the follow-up of ERITS 2 study. I have, I have no financial disclosures to give, um, other than the fact that the Bosch and Loam actually holds a royalty bearing license to the ARID supplement at NEI. So macular degeneration, as you know, is the leading cause of blindness in, in the United States in the white population, and it ranks third in global cause of visual impairment. Uh, and globally, it accounts for 9% of all, all the blindness that we have, and it's gonna go up really quite high. Even though the prevalence is actually coming down, the number of people affected are going to increase because we're all living longer. Uh, so it's going to be up to 288 million people uh, by 2040. And the risk factors that we know are aging, uh, off the age graciously, smoking, education, nutrition, and genetics. So I'm going to just touch upon some of the nutritional aspect of this and some of the findings we have from the 10 year study. It's, there's quite a bit of of data from this. I'm just gonna just really focus on a few things and just um, talk about those. I wanna be really uh, on the same page with everyone because different epidemiologists call early AMD different. Uh, so some people call large drusen early, but what we're calling early AMD are those with medium-sized drusen. Once you have large drusen, you're considered to be intermediate AMD. Of course, the late form are those with the wet or knee vascular form or the geographic atrophy. Uh, more recently, ERITS2 has suggested um, not only a central GA, but non-central GA. Once you reach GA anywhere in the retina, it's considered to be an outcome. And this is something rather new for the ERITS2 study. This is the timeline of what we've done with ERITS and ERITS2. Uh, it's hard to believe it's been a long time ago. It's been really 20 years since ERITS1 finished. Uh, and now we're at 10 years, you know, ERITS2 has finished. Uh, we follow patients, of course, uh, in ERITS-1 for a longer period of time. In ERITS-2, I'm going to talk about the, the three to the long-term follow-up of this. So in 20, 2001, we announced the results of the study of the ERITS-1 in which we 
looked at vitamin C, vitamin E, beta carotene, and zinc. This was supposed to be a natural history study. Dr. Kupfer started this. And he said, you know, drusen leads to these things. And what if we look for drusen? Why are we interested in this? We need to look for an intervention. And at that point, we really didn't know what to do. We call on our nutritional experts. And at that point, there were a lot of trials on cardiovascular disease and cancer looking at high dose vitamins. And as you know, none of those panned out. Vitamin E for cardiovascular disease, beta carotene for lung cancer. Uh, in fact, beta carotene increased the risk of lung cancer. So the vitamins went down the tube. And we thought, well, you know, we'll continue and see what we find. And lo and behold, to our surprise, we actually found the combination of vitamins and zinc resulted in 25% reduction in the risk of progression to late AMD in five years. And we follow these patients through at 10 years. This is now published uh, at five years after the trial was finished. At that point, you can see that the placebo had the highest rate of progression for probably of late AMD. And for those with, with moderate vision loss, also placebo was the worst and the combination was best and, and antioxidants uh, plus zinc was the, was the most powerful uh, treatment. And this is sort of the odds ratio that we see. It's almost a, a, a third reduction in the rate of late AMD at 10 years, but it's, we still see it's 25% reduction. Uh, and this is providing every patient we had in the follow-up actually was off the placebo. We gave them the supplement. So if you were on the supplement, uh, at, at the very beginning, and we analyze you all the way through, you maintain that treatment effect. So in other words, there was some beneficial effect that persisted even at 10 years when we actually had everybody on, on the drugs. There was no placebo in the last five years. So for knee vascular AMD, it was 0.60. And for geographic atrophy, we did not find a beneficial effect using the ARIT supplement. The data from the ARITS uh, observational data, looking at their dietary intake was at very interesting. Uh, we looked to, at the baseline to see what they ate over the past year. And we took heed of what was important and who progressed to what disease and what happened over time. So two factors came up as being very important. Lutein zeaxanthine in green leafy vegetables and omega-3 fatty acids found in fish uh, were found to be the two leading factors that were important in terms of the dietary outcomes. So if you look at patients with dietary lutein zeaxanthine, you can see that people having large drusen, medium sized or, or, or intermediate drusen, intermediate AMD with large drusen, geographic atrophy or knee vascular AMD, anything to the left of, the, of one favors a high intake. So the higher the, the, the dietary intake, the more likely you have less disease. And, also, we found that the highest intake was decreased as much as 50% in development of late AMD. This is also true for dietary intake of fatty acids. You can see that the baseline on evascular AMD was reduced. They had taken fish quite early. An incident developing new GA, they found that there was actually a protective effect in terms of almost a 50% reduction in the risk of uh, uh, of developing late AMD. And this is an intake of fish, what we call high intake, which is tw twice a week is considered high. So the objective of ARITS 2 was a little different. We really were interested in seeing where these two factors were important. How can we add to the, uh, the original ARITS formulation to see if it had any effects on AMD outcomes? So this is a tougher trial because everybody's going to be on the ARITS supplement. We want to see whether these two things have any effect when we add them on there. And the study is different from ARITS-1. We had controls in ARITS-1 that had no AMD. We're looking at cataract effects. In this case, ARITS-2 were all patients would already have AMD, intermediate AMD or late AMD in one eye. And here's the primary randomization. We call it controlled because all the patients are on ARITS supplement. They're either taking lutein, omega-3s, or the combination of the two. And we also looked at lutein and beta-carotene randomization to see if we can get rid of the beta-carotene which has been found to be an increased risk for lung cancer. So our primary outcome showed that, unfortunately, the, the, the omega-3 had neither beneficial or harmful effect. With lutein cesanthine, we found an incremental increase in the benefits. In the secondary analysis, if you look at patients who do not eat lutein at all, there's a 25% reduction in the rate of late AMD. When we do a head-to-head -head comparison between patients taking beta-carotene versus lutein, Lutein always wins, it's always a favorable effect with lutein. It's 20% beneficial effect over beta carotene. And this is, um, this is what we found in terms of uh, lutein favoring, um, favoring the beta carotene. And this is almost a 20% reduction in the rate of both the vascular AMD 
an advanced AMD, but not so much for geographic atrophy. Uh, so it's about 20% effect. But the, I think the most interesting aspect and, the, and concerning aspect was that there was a twofold increased risk of lung cancer in those assigned to beta carotene versus lutein. 90% of these were former smokers. So even if you stop smoking, the risk of cancer still is there and is increased by the risk of taking beta carotene. So we were very concerned about this. And for that reason, we removed the beta carotene in the ARITS formulation, replaced it with lutein, zeaxanthine, and we did not add omega-3 because it didn't have any effect at all. So after the study closed, we followed these patients and we followed them through uh, six month telephone uh, conversations and we would gather information. Our primary outcome was really to look at what happens to omega-3 fatty acids, or rather uh, looking cisanthine and lung cancer and also omega-3 fatty acids, whether it had any beneficial or harmful effects. But the lung cancer was particularly important because uh, there were some thoughts that lutein cisanthine might have an effect on, on lung cancer. Of course, we we're also looking long, long term prognosis for AMD and for cataract surgery. And also, we had been in, instituted uh, the cognitive function testing in the study. We wanted to carry that on as well. The FOX study was conducted by centralized telephone interviews that every six months we call up the patients. We have a self-report of cataract surgery or other procedures like you know, point of transplant, diagnosis and treatment AMD events were also self-reported. And then we verify these by talking to the doctor and getting the consent from the patient and getting the records from the medical doctors. And all the participants at this point received ARITS2 supplement. And once the clinical trial stopped, we gave them the ARITS2 supplement. So almost everyone took it. On a subset of 1,000 IRS2 participants from 19 clinical sites, we had a one-time in-clinic visit to look at their eye exam, comprehensive eye exam. We did OCTs, um, OCT angiography when available. We did the optos imaging, which I'm going to show you a bit about. Image op optos is this very ultra-wide field imaging that looks not just at the 35 or 45 degrees or 50 degrees, but way 200 degrees. So it gives you a lot more information. We also did some blood draw for ancillary iPSC cell uh, protocols. We produced some iPS cells, iPSC cell lines from this. And I'm going to speak a little bit more about that at the end of this, uh, this talk about the research community access to this particular IC, IS, IPSC, iPSC cells. So these are the follow-up sites that who were uh, uh, participated in our one-time one eye visit. And the rest were patients who were just in their homes and we did the telephone calls. The phenotype where we, for these patients, we're using multimodal imaging. And I think this helps to add to the tenure year follow-up and also help validate our verification by the telephone uh, recommendations as well. So approximately 3,200 patients were alive with ultimately the follow-up at the end of the study. We ended up following about 2,500 participants. We had more deaths, a few refusals, and, and a few loss to follow-up. And these were conducted using the Cox proportional hazards model and these are the results we have. So the long-term effects of lung cancer was our primary outcome. So we looked at lutein, this was not so significant. There was really no increased risk of lung cancer from lutein. But again, with beta carotene, we found at 10 years with more events, because lung cancer would take a longer time if we you know, supplement with lutein, would it take longer? The beta carotene which patients were given and stopped still had an effect. Uh, even at 10 years, we found almost a doubling of the risk of lung cancer. And so I think we were very, um, I think we're very prudent to remove beta carotene from our, from our supplements and replace it with lutein. This is the original outcome at five years when we looked at the four different arms, lutein versus placebo, uh, DHA versus placebo, D, uh, DHA, EPA, and lutein and zeaxanthine together versus placebo. You can see that they were not statistically significant. However, when we now look at it at 10 years by treatment arm, the lutein cisanthine is now significant at 0.04, uh, and the DPA and EHA and the combination remain the same. So there still there seems to be a, a treatment effect, especially with lutein cisanthine. That was looking at the four different arms. So we compare lutein to placebo and DHA versus placebo, the combination versus placebo. But now we're looking at the analysis of the main effects. This is when we actually look at all patients who had lutein cisanthine, so that's half the population, and compare them with those who don't take uh, lutein cisanthine. And then we also look at patients who love DHA and those who don't take DHA. So that gives us many more patients, double the patient. You can see then again, the main effect of lutein cisanthine is significant at 0.03, uh, almost a, a 9 to 10% reduction. 
uh, DHA, EPA, and the combination had or, uh, really had no, had no effect. Low zinc versus high zinc, which we tested as well. Again, these were not statistically significant. Beta carotene versus, versus lutein, uh, versus no beta carotene, rather. Again, no effect in this case. So similar to the original ERITS-2, lutein, the main effect was a beneficial effect in reducing the risk of late AMD. And again, when we look by the types of AMD, we see again, it's a nevascular AMD that was very beneficial for. Well, the supplements seem to help. This is the lutein azeaxanthin main effect up here. And the second one is lutein versus beta carotene directly. And you can see that this is a, a beneficial effect. Uh, again, this is very similar to what we found in, in the original study. So we're always concerned what happens to mortality. Uh, are patients affected by this? And this is looking at the mortality over time over 10 years. You can see that of the 25 thousand patients, 100 patients are left. Uh, there is actually no increase or decrease in, in mortality, almost identical for dose by lutein treatment. And so there is absolutely no changes in mortality. And that was also true for DHA and EPA. Uh, there was no difference in mortality. I'm gonna now talk about a couple of, uh, of uh, publications in which uh, I, I've had a lot of collaborations from uh, Dr. Julie Mayers, who's University of Wisconsin a nutritional specialist. And of course, uh, my friend Anansua Roop, who's a major player in this as well, and, and uh, one of his, uh, our shared uh, postdoc, uh, Freke von Austin from Holland, was very instrumental in helping us with these, these studies, looking at the diet, both macro generation as well as the cognitive function. So let's start with some discussions about Mediterranean diet. We're very interested in this because we know that uh, this has been known to reduce cardiovascular disease in Crete. This is noted, you know, decades ago, and they, and they realized that the cardiovascular disease that was so, so so reduced in this, in this particular population was probably due to population, but that's observational data. So what they actually did a clinical trial, and this was in Spain, where they looked at 7,000 participants and seen, who were at high risk for cardiovascular disease, randomized them to Mediterranean diet or a controlled uh, diet with low fat. What they found was it reduced cardiovascular disease by as much as 30%. So this is the first and only randomized trial we have of a dietary uh, supplement or uh, dietary uh, uh, pattern that was really important. So the questions, of course, are what happens with the AMD? Is there a similar effect? So there are previous studies that looked at this, uh, the longitudinal study done by uh, Dr. Johanna Seddon and uh, Dr. Merle, looked at the ERITS data, just the ERITS one by itself, and they found some changes. The IRIS consortium are a multiple European studies put together, Rotterdam I study, um, and a number of others. There's some cross-sectional eye studies from Europe as well as others. And they found that the high Mediterranean diet adherence, the more you eat of that, the less you have progression of late AMD by as much as 25 to 40%. So we were very interested in looking at our ERITS-1 and ERITS-2 data. Uh, and so our data, you know, obviously the, the European diet is a little bit different from the North American. We call this an alternative Mediterranean diet, but it still has the same nine components, you know, low on red meat, whole grains, lots of whole grains, uh, the, the, the ratio of, of monounsaturated fat, fatty acids compared to sat saturated ones, moderate fish intake, white meat and dairy products, low to moderate alcohol intake, and high consumptions of fruits, vegetables, nuts, and legumes. So it has nine components, and we basically use um, our questionnaires, which were done at baseline. And this is the ERITS-1 and ERITS-2. They're slightly different. The ERITS-1 was done by Gladys Block, uh, which was a National, National, National Cancer Institute type of, uh, of questionnaire. And the second one was done by uh, the Harvard one uh, done by Willette. And we asked the participants self-report of their dietary intake in the past year using the food history questionnaire. And that give us a gradation of what they've eaten and we've been into nine different components. And then we add them all up to see how high are they in, in the actual uh, Mediterranean diet. And for this analysis, we had over 7,756 uh, 7, 7, 7, 7, participants, and the mean age was slightly more in the ERIS-2 population, as you can see, and again, a little bit more women than men, usually about 60% usually women, and the smoking status were, were fairly similar, and we have the alternative Mediterranean diet in three and the fertiles. Uh, and again, these are patients who had no baseline AMD. So this is these are the numbers. 
And this, these are the findings that we have. When we look at this, you're looking at a forest plot. One means neutral. Anything to the left of one is protective. Anything to the right of one is harmful. And you can see we have a different types of AMD as well as late AMD. So this is moderate intake is turtile two and turtile three is the highest intake compared to the turtile one, which is the lowest intake. You can see there's really almost a, a, there's a dose response. The more you eat, the more likely protection you have, and especially show for geographic atrophy. And this comes out to a hazard ratio of 0.71. These are statistically significant. Because we've done so many analyses, we did a Bonferroni correction. It has to be 0.017 to be statistically significant. So even the moderate intake was not considered to be a significant because it had to be less than 0.017. You can see that for nevascular AMD and for late AMD, uh, there certainly is a reduction in the, in, in the, in the uh, progression to either late AMD, uh, either geographic atrophy or nevascular AMD. So the higher the intake, the less the progression. When we look at the different components, what pops out, especially for, for in Eris, was fish. And there's, there's some, of course, you know, whole grains and vegetables are protective as well here but it's not statistically significant because of our very uh, stringent criteria for 0.002. And what pops out, of course, is fish. And the highest intake of fish, a hazard ratio of 0.69, translates to a 31% decrease in the risk of progression to geographic atrophy in those patients who had the highest intake of fish compared to those who never eat fish. And this is looking at patients who have no large drusen, people who have either no, no drusen or going from medium-sized drusen to large drusen, going from early to intermediate AMD. Again, you see a beneficial effect that in, that in, this, in this case, it's really for high intake, uh, the hazard ratio is 0.75. So it's a 25% reduction in the risk of even developing a large drusen or intermediate AMD. So at all levels of AMD, there was some protective effect. So people who already have AMD who are intermediate also have an effect. People who are at the early stage also have a beneficial effect from this. And this is really just a, a, a um, summary of what we found, uh, the hazard ratios, and you can see what's statistically significant. And mostly it was for geographic atrophy, which is very strong. Uh, and we see it for nevascular AMD for the combined cohort, but not so much for ERITS2 uh, and ERITS1 by itself. And you can see late AMD also um, goes through. So the high adherence to alternative medicine, uh, Mediterranean diet has a lower risk of AMD. And this is also true for, for fish. We found that, again, fish was uh, in both nevascular and geographic atrophy. Uh, the Bonferroni here is 0.02. So we, we, are, we certainly see that this is significant, especially in ERITS. But ERITS2 is different. These patients, as you recall, have very much more severe AMD. They're all already older patients. And in fact, they ate more fish than, than the, the population in the era. So this was 10 years later. I think the diets had changed a little bit. People are understanding. I think the cardiovascular uh, folks have been recommending that this is a, a heart healthy diet. I think fish twice a week is what cardiologists also, also recommend. So I think there's been some change. Uh, we have very highly educated groups in the volunteers for these studies. And ERITS2 in particular were highly educated groups. So, it's not surprising we, we see the results that we do. We were interested in the genetic interactions with the, um, with the diet. As you can see that we took the two most, two most common um, uh, SNPs in AMD, the ones we know are important for progression of AMD and looking for a genetic interaction. And we found that, you know, that didn't matter what, <clears throat> what your genetic uh, makeup was, a Mediterranean diet had a beneficial effect no matter what. So this, this was in this population. However, when we looked at the interaction uh, of genetics in the ERIS population, uh, we did see that there was a geographic atrophy with complement factor H. And when we looked specifically at fish, what we found interestingly was that there, the protective allele of complement factor H, if you had that protective allele, there was an increase in the beneficial effect. So you can see that this is very different from what we had before. So if you have protective effect, you increase your risk, or increase your, your ability to actually fight uh, the geographic atrophy. So it's like you almost, uh, almost double your, your, your ability to reduce the rate of geographic atrophy if you're fortunate to have that, that beneficial effect. 
So all in all, mentoring diet seems to really increase progression late AMD in those with intermediate AMD, also those progressing the large Jews into early AMD. Uh, so it appears to be normal, nor to be really important for both early and those intermediate AMD. So it's never too late to start a diet. But of course, these are associations and these are not uh, you know, results of clinical trials, but certainly very compelling data. And just turn our attention to cognitive function. Uh, we know that Alzheimer affects 5.2 million people in the US, uh, 46 million worldwide. And this is gonna triple in the next four decades. We're all living longer. And it's depressing to think 131 million people by 2050 may have Alzheimer's or some form of cognitive impairment. And one of the things that we were interested in when we started a study was the hypothesis where the omega-3 uh, had any effect on cognitive function. There were large trials that were ongoing at the time. All of them have been negative. We of course looked at the observational data. We were interested, of course, in fish because that's been described elsewhere. We did this uh, cognitive function testing by telephone and it's called the TICS test. Those of you who are familiar with this is a mini mental state examination that's done by telephone. It's been validated in, in both settings. Uh, we asked for immediate and delayed recall, looking at the fluency of words and animals and verbal fluency, executive function, counting backwards, subtracting seven from a hundred backwards. And of course, to, before we even start the test, we want to make sure they can hear us from the you know, telephone test. And we did a test of hearing. We also did a test of depression. The depression also affects your cognitive function. And we had two forms. The full form was 30 minutes long. There were a few patients who really couldn't you know, have that long attention span. We did it for 10, 15 in the short form. The majority of them were in the, in, the short, in, the, in the long form, rather. We tested at baseline and every two years by certified examiners. These examiners had their results actually uh, recorded and they were graded and they were certified every year for this assessment. So this is done very rigorously. We had money from, from NIMH and NIA uh, to do this. This was in collaboration for other institutes as well. Our primary outcome was to look at the effect of omega-3s on cognition. We also looked at the secondary analysis of all the nutritional factors. The, our main outcome is looking at change in the global score. That's like all the composite scores of all the tests we did, as well as the change <clears throat> in ticks during the follow-up from, from baseline. We adjusted for factors we know that, that influence cognition. For example, the older you get, the more likely you're to play at it. Uh, sex, unfortunately, females get it more often than male. Uh, <clears throat> and race, education level, and hypertension are the main factors that we actually adjusted for. And so not everybody um, did cognitive function, but only 462 out of the 4,200 patients did not do it. And, and, and as you would expect, I'll just tell you that they, the ones who actually participate tended to be younger, tended to be white, and higher levels of education, and less likely to have hypertension. They were more likely to be <clears throat> healthier people who took the test. So we look at baseline, when we looked at, when we looked at the comparison, because it's such a large number, everything was, was really very, very, equal in both arms. So there was no differences in terms of age, as sex, uh, education levels, and their, their, their statin use, their smoking status. Uh, everything was pretty much a level playing field in the randomized trial, which you hope to see. And these are the results. So again, we're looking at force plots. The middle and the zero is no change. The line is the confidence interval, 99% confidence intervals, and the little black squares are the, are the point estimates. And you can see all the point estimates and the lines and the 99% confidence will all go over one. So there's nothing really significant in any way. So there's no beneficial or harmful effect on cognition with omega-3. And this is also true for lutein cesanthine. Again, you see the ticks and the composite score and all the different tests that were done. And again, we found that there's no harmful or beneficial effect of lutein on the cognition in this case. And the same with uh, varying doses of zinc. We had 25 milligrams of zinc versus 80 milligrams of zinc. And this is actually what started our study on cognition. In, in errors, in the first study, uh, just as we were completing our, our study of five year, there were some studies suggesting that the, uh, the zinc in test tubes caused these tangles that you see in Alzheimer's to actually develop. And we were very concerned. So in errors, we actually looked at that. And I can give you some uh, information on that as we talk about the diet. So we also looked at beta carotene versus no beta carotene. Again, there is no effect on the cognition. So in other words, perhaps eating foods is more important than being supplement. And we'll, I'll show you that as we, as we go on. 
Again, we did similar analysis looking at the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet, uh, again, in a similar manner. Remember, and this is now in Eretz as well, because we did clock function at that one time point at year five. And actually, we did a second one, but we only used one at year five. And this one, you could see, again, a, a really a dose response. In Eretz, patients who had the highest intake of Mediterranean diet, they had a reduction in cognitive impairment. Uh, compared to Turtile 1 and Turtile 2, there's also a, a sort of dose effect. And this is also for composite score as well as, as, well as a mini mental. So clearly, uh, we found some reduction that's pretty significant, almost 63% reduction uh, for the mini mental in patients who had uh, the Turtile 3 of the Mediterranean diet and also the composite was 44%. So this is quite interesting that, that the diet is so important. So at high adherence to Mediterranean diet is again also associated with decreased cognitive impairment, just like we had for AMD. And this is for ERITS2. ERITS2 was even stronger in the sense we found that uh, it was significant for both Turtile 2 and Turtile 3. So there's clearly a truly res a, a response. The more you eat, the more likely you have a higher protective effect. And this again, a 44% you know, reduction. And again, high adherence Mediterranean diet is really uh, important in you know, decreased cognitive impairment. We again looked at the different components, and you can see in this case, fish again stands out for the cognition, and the hazard ratio is 0.36, and the Bonferroni correction really is was, was really strict. And again, we see that this was significant with a 64% reduction in the risk of cognitive impairment in errors in those patients with the highest intake of fish. Again, that's twice a week. Uh, and this is also true for ERITS2, very similar for ERITS2. The cognition uh, was a little bit less protect protection, 46, but still a really uh, incredible good hazard ratio in this case. So the closer to adherence to Mediterranean diet was associated with the lower risk of cognitive impairment. And component of fish was again associated with decreased risk of cognitive impairment. And the closer Actually, the closer Mediterranean diet was not associated with slower decline in areas two, which we measured a decline, but fish intake itself was associated with a decreased decline. So we're not sure what that means. Um, most dietary data do not suggest that there's actually effect on the, on the actual decline, but this one certainly has some effect and it's very interesting. Very few studies actually show that. So that's really the dietary information that we have on this. I wanted then to talk a bit about um, something that, that that's really talk about, and it's in one of our ancestry studies. And I, I think you'll find this interesting as researchers who are interested in and what happens in AMD. And these are the peripheral retinal changes associated with AMD on why field fundus photography at year five. This is an ancestry study. We actually got machines from Optos, which is a company in Scotland that made these very wide field uh, photograph uh, cameras. And this man was very interesting. He, he himself uh, was an engineer and his young son had that little attachment and had lost vision at a very young age. And his goal in, in life was to get everybody screened on these large cameras so they can look for the retinal changes and prevent what happened to his son. So it was very, it, it, it's very admirable what he wanted to do for, for, for humankind. And, and also what's interesting is way back in 1973, Shirley Sarks, who is a pathologist in Australia, uh, was very interested in AMD. Interestingly, uh, she was married to an uh, ophthalmologist, and the ophthalmologist had only one arm. He was a remarkable man. I've met them both. And he, uh, was, he was working in nursing homes, and, and he was able to uh, receive, a, 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 not only through him, but through other sources. She was a great pathologist and did a great deal of work on AMD. And this is one of the interesting studies in which you look at autopsy eyes of 150 eyes greater than 62 years of age, and 100 of them had evidence of AMD. And about a third of them had coral neovascularization. What's interesting is that the coral neovascularization is not only in the macula, only 60%, 62% were in the macula, but there were a quarter that were on the peripapillary area around the nerve, and 13% were out far in the periphery, which we would never really document or see. So that was our first sign that this is really uh, an interesting aspect to look at, just look at the peripheral retina. And this is work by uh, Christine Curcio. Um, she published this in 1990, and she did rod counts throughout the retina. As you can see, as far out, she, uh, far out you get, there's hardly any rods. I mean, so there's a real rich 
around which area, and that's the area that's implicated in AMD. And that's the area that's really bright red. And you can see where the optic nerve is and where the fovea is, especially with the fovea, there's actually no rods you can see. So, so given this idea that rod is important for AMD and the rods are everywhere, not just you know, uh, in certain spots, and even in the macula, there's really no rods. And the other interesting aspect is that um, we are interested in these, uh, for clinicians, this is called aging changes. They call them senile reticular pigmentary generation. It doesn't sound so good, but they call it senile reticular pigmentary degeneration, which is found with aging, even without patients without AMD. And the paving stone generation, uh, you might think this is GA, but it's very just different from GA. Uh, and so we're looking for aging changes. Our, our idea was to look at our patients at year five as they exit, uh, and this was only in a select number. Of, I think it was um, seven or eight clinics that we had who did, the, who did this, and we, we used the optos, and we had the uh, patients look up and down so we can get maximized the coverage of the actual uh, retina. So the questions we asked was, how frequent were these peripheral retinal lesions in the macular generation cases? And in the peripheral retinal lesions and uh, age match controls, do we see similar changes? And we're looking for aging changes, which I just talked about with senile reticular pigmentary changes in the paving stone. Are, are these lesions uh, also found in aging or found also in AMD? And, and is, are these changes in AMD accelerated type of aging changes that we're looking at? And this is one of the first studies that looked at the peripheral, peripheral retina uh, in AMD. And this is what a, a photograph looks like. What I showed you earlier is really just even less than zone one. That's what we'd be looking at. And we do three serial fields. We do one, two, and three out here. So we cover about this much, much of area. I don't know if you can see my cursor. That's what we cover in our standard photographs. But now with this uh, wide angle optos, you're out to 200 degrees and way out, you can actually see way out in the periphery. So this is a normal control. Uh, you can see that. We also can get fundus autofluorescence on this, on this camera. And it, this autofluorescence is a little different from the ones we usually get. So it doesn't quite translate to the same autofluorescence that we see in other images that we do. But here's a case of peripheral drusen, uh, lots of reticular pigmentary changes, patients with GA. I mean, there's just a little bit of GA in the macula, but look at all the material that's happening, all the things that are happening in the periphery. That really has had quite a bit of, of, uh, of disease way out in this case. So we had uh, 484 participants and we had 951 eyes. And you can see that 30% uh, of them had knee vascular disease and 24% have geographic atrophy in the macula. That's zone one. That's one that, I, that we usually have for our usual ERITS um, um, rating. Areas two, or zone two rather, is further out. You can see that. And then if you look right here on, on the gradable area, they're pretty gradable until you get to zone three and, and inferior. I'll just go back to, the, to this. So zone three would be, uh, would be this zone here. So looking down, you can see there's also already eyelashes getting in the way. So this was not very gradable, where zone one, two, and three, superior three was pretty good. But down below, we had problems with the eyelashes. So that's what it shows. And then it shows you what proportion uh, have, have are gradable. And, and these are all very gradable, 30% of AMD. And these are actually all gradable. And we're just telling you what the, what the disease might be. So here we are in cases with the, uh, the controls. Uh, they're pretty gradable, but even the zone three is only 71% that are gradable. So mostly uh, the other zones are pretty good. And this is what we found in our, in our study. So if you look at patients who are cases uh, in zone one, as you would expect, 98% of them have drusen. 97% 97 in zone two of cases have drusen. So if you have drusen in those cases, you have drusen in the periphery as well too, uh, in zone two and zone three superiorly 78%. Zone three might be a little bit underestimate because we really cut, could not grade it as well as we could. And clearly there are differences between the cases and controls. You see these are any drusen, so the controls are patients who may have small or medium-sized drusen, and so the large drusen is what we're looking for in terms of cases. So that's why about a third of them actually have in, in controls. But even in controls, there is still changes in the periphery as well. So the drusen and characteristics in cases uh, in which we're looking at large drusen, drusen is 250 microns, 
we see that that's not so much, uh, we don't have that in the controls. But in the cases, we see that again, uh, that there's almost a same amount in zone two, a fewer in zone three, but clearly even in the controls, we don't have large drusen, but there are drusen in the periphery as well. We often talk about the hyperpigmentary changes and hypopigmentary changes in places with um, AMD. And again, you see some in the controls, but you see that the hyperpigmentary changes are, are, are more in hyperpigmentary changes and less in hypopigmentary change, partly because they are very transient. I think hyperpigmentary changes go like to GA pretty quickly, but you see there are differences between cases and controls in this case. We check for pseudodrusen, which we have not touched and talked about. Um, again, you've heard Christine Perso talk about it. These are, are changes we see that are on top of the apical part of the, uh, of the RPE. We see subretinal drusen as opposed to the typical drusen we see in AMD, which is sub RPE. You can see that pseudohypoglobin drusen is only seen in the cases and you have not seen it in our controls. It's thought that maybe something like 0.3% of the whole general population might have reticular pseudodrusen, but we only have a small sampling, so we wouldn't have that. So, what about the aging changes in the, in the reticular drusen, uh, reticular uh, pigmentary changes? You can see that. Uh, all peripheral retinal changes, we see it in cases and controls as well. And if we look specifically at very specific retinal changes we know are aging, um, clearly they're very equal. In fact, um, we see more in the cases as well. So this could accelerate aging as well. So the aging changes in addition to what we see as AMD are seen in both here. We took the pigmentary changes in the periphery are equal and you see it both in cases and controls. So clearly that is an aging change that we do see that's really important as well. Some is autofluorescence results. I'll just close it very quickly. Um, this is a case of fundus autofluorescence. Abnormal autofluorescence, we see less so in the controls, much more so in, in the cases. And hyperpigmentary changes in fundus autofluorescence. Um, in some ways, a hyper, hyper, hyper uh, fundus autofluorescence was very similar in cases and controls, but in the hypo, uh, changes we see that is more likely in, in the actual cases. We took a, pig, a, we took a pseudo drusen, which we talked about again, we see only a fundus autofluorescence in the cases as well. So peripheral retinal abnormalities are common in eyes and less than age match controls, but the reticular pigmentary changes are most common and they are found in both AMD and aging. And it's just astonishing that drusen is found outside the posterior pole in 97% of the areas to suffer. Uh, subjects that really have a lot of patients who have even the macro changes. This is not just a macro change, it's more like a almost like a pan retinal change. And the peripheral changes are seen in normal aging but exaggerated in AMD. I think the peripheral L changes can be important in the classification of AMD. Uh, we have to think some more about that as, as well as reticular pseudodrusen, very important. So I'm going to just show you some of the changes we see. And this was five year now, I'm going to talk about the five year. I'm going to show you the 10 year data. Uh, and what happened, that's not the data, I'm just gonna show you some cases. We haven't finished all our analysis on the actual um, markings and things, but look at the difference. The five year, you can see the five year on your left. This is the right eye of a patient. You can see some, uh, G, some GA changes, but the patient has good vision in this case. Uh, there's some changes here in the periphery, but look at all the increased change over time. Look at this change over here. You can see it much, best, better, much better in the fundus autofluorescence. So in the right eye, the patient now has dropped the vision dramatically because the phobia is, is involved in this case. And in the left eye, very similar findings, you, especially in the fundus autofluorescence, you see this increase in the geographic atrophy. Uh, and this is in the left eye of the same patient. This is now honing into the macro part of that same patient. You can see that the macro changes were in, in the, oops, sorry, let me go back. You can see that the fovea is hardly preserved right there, but here the, the vision has, has gone down uh, and there probably some knee vascularization has, has occurred. And the geographic atrophy on fundus autofluorescence, the black is not good. You can see that there's a lot more black areas. We're missing the RPE or looking at the cordial vessel. So the geographic atrophy has progressed dramatically in the five years. And this is, this is the, the left eye in the macular part of the left eye. You can see that this patient uh, probably had fairly good, was hanging on to 20-20 vision in this area, but by 
another five years, this is gone. So this is a really remarkable uh, change. And, and here's another patient in the right eye. You can see that there are uh, areas of uh, drusen, uh, five years and 10 years, but you see peripapillary changes. Uh, I think there's some knee vascularization that occur. You see fundus autofluorescence and some more changes. The geographic atrophy has progressed further. These black spots have increased and still may have fairly decent vision, but you can see that there is progression over time. And this is the fellow eye and the geographic atrophy has grown. You can see more areas. This has gotten larger. Uh, and as you know, the periphery has gotten more. So in conclusion, I have presented to you the efficacy of ARIS2 supplement. It continues when compared to beta carotene, especially for nevascular AMD, despite the lack of controls. I think it's really quite amazing that that, that has really continued. Uh, there's increased risk of lung cancer for beta carotene. And we see that at the 10 year mark, making beta, uh, make, making beta carotene really not a good supplement. Uh, lutein cysanthine is safer for the ARIS2 supplements. The results are similar for the long-term results of ARITS and the beneficial, they, they, they actually persisted despite the lack of placebo control. Everybody was on the actual um, uh, supplements. And one more thing I think I wanna say is about the, the diet. The diet actually was very interesting in terms of the Mediterranean diet. Um, a lot needs to be studied in terms of what happens with that. And certainly the genetic interactions are interesting and perhaps they'll help us with some uh, idea of mechanism. Uh, the, the grading of these uh, uh, in-clinic visit uh, photos are continuing on, but the ultra-wide fields that I showed you today shows a marked progression of disease. It's not just a macular disease, it's really a panretinal disease. We will provide further on, uh, information on progression in cataracts and AMD, especially with the, the multimodal assessment. And these longitudinal data are really important for, for deep learning. I didn't go into that. We've been doing a lot of work in deep learning. We can have the image and the medical data and natural language processing as well. And I just want to say a few words about the iPSC cells. We have, um, at the end of this study, when we did the, the clinic, in-clinic patient uh, study, we drew blood on about 300 patients. We developed 73 induced pluripotent stem cell lines that are derived from these ART2 participants. So we have their genetic uh, profile. We also have their you know, their phenotyping, which has been done over, over a long time. Uh, and there are correlates of the, you know, of the image, imaging and everything. And that's being put up into a DB gap as well as a, uh, a common platform called BRICS that, that's very much NEI specific. And so these uh, lines are now available for academic and commercial entities, anyone who wants to have them uh, either use this email or contact me later. Uh, indicating which lines you would like to, uh, to obtain. We're also doing isogenic controls that are being generated and will be probably available later on and maybe the third or fourth quarter of this year, they should be available. They're being, they're being worked on right now. And um, Steve Becker from my group wanted to, from, from NEI wanted to tell you about a, uh, a NICEF or a, a New York stem cell um, uh, virtual symposium they're gonna have and it's March 23rd. Uh, at 5 p.m. And again, this will be uh, having Sandy Chang, who is an expert in AMD as well. Uh, and there's also another one uh, that's open to the public. That's a virtual webinar with an NEI one. So that the first one is, uh, is the New York stem cell one, which is uh, in March 23rd. And the next one is March 30th, which is an NEI and a nice sort of, uh, informational webinar talking about the, uh, the, the cells and the quality controls and what you can do to do this. With that, I could thank the ARITS investigators and my participants who were so wonderful, the thousands of participants who, who helped us. And, and the ARITS one had 11 clinical sites. We had 82 clinical sites. And we have really hundreds of hundreds and hundreds of investigators who really helped with this project. So this is only possible because of these wonderful uh, collaborators that we've had over the years. I'd like to thank my wonderful colleagues at uh, NEI who contributed so much to, to all this work. And these are the folks who are some of their names of them. And I'd like to end up with a quote from Helen Keller. Alone, we can do so little. Together, we can do so much. Thank you so much for your attention. and happy to take any questions. Thank you, Amy. If you have any questions, please send me a chat. And uh, until then, uh, anybody? 
And the final, uh, final person who will ask question and comment will be Kathy today. Okay. Uh, I'm glad to ask a question, Emily. Great talk, Barry Coop. Barry Coop, I'm here in case you can't see me or hear my I see voice. You. I see you. I see Perfect. You. Um, so again, to clarify, you know, historically we've learned that AREDS2 formulation did not help the progression to geographic atrophy. That's been kind of the side. Does inhibit this, slow down the progression to neovascular AMD. But with, with is, so just to clarify, is it the Mediterranean diet and particularly the fish component that does in fact uh, seem to be associated with that? Or is it that in combination with the AREDS2 supplementation? I just wanted to make, is, is that, is so that it, an add on to the AREDS2? Yeah, the AREDS, yeah. it, it's actually distinct from AREDS supplement. It didn't have, it actually have any impact from AREDS supplement. So the AREDS2 uh, did not affect the Mediterranean diet in any way. So it's kind of interesting that the supplement was for neovascular AMD. It was almost complementary and that the diet was especially strong for geographic atrophy. And maybe between the two of them, you could maybe, maybe conquer your AMD in some way. But clearly, um, we need to do something earlier. I think if we can prevent AMD from going to large jurors and would be a really wonderful thing. And that's something that's sort of my dream list to do and to go to an ARIS-3 where we can do something. Don't know what that might be, but but certainly that would be that would be the ultimate goal. And that was sort of implicit in the AREDS one in that that was in that formulation that they looked at these subset of people that actually had nutritional intake components. And that's what that informed AREDS two. And the omega three was not found to be associated there, but the fish in AREDS one was. So again, it does feel like there's been multiple steps where where actual diet versus nutritional supplementation um, uh, may influence this disease uh, uh, more than we'd appreciate it, particularly with fish versus omega-3. And it, even omega-3s are, I think, are even now suspect in the cardiology field, uh, less interest in omega-3 supplementation than there used to be historically. Yeah, Dorada could probably address this better than I can. She's, she's really interested in the very long chain fatty acids, which may have some interesting aspect, but there's something in fish that's important, but omega-3, you know, at least the, the 22 chain of long-chain fatty acids were not important, either for heart cognition or for, for AMD. So most of the studies have gone, the only one big study was the GC study done in the days when we didn't have statin use. So the cardiovascular was, was helped by that, but that hasn't been replicated, unfortunately. So. so last question, just to clarify for our patients, what is the recommendation on fish? Is that twice a week? Is it more than twice a week? What, what are you recommending that we tell our well, patients? Well, we usually say at least twice, you know, twice a week is what's considered high in, in okay. these diets. So, I mean, it could be opening a can of tuna salad or tuna fish, and you could do that. So, I mean, it's, 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 and it's problematic because I think fish is hard for older people to get. Uh, and we didn't ask what types of fish, all people always ask, them, what type of fish should it be? We think it should be cold water fish, but we really don't know that. And finally, it just occurred to me, patients ask, what about shrimp? Does shrimp qualify as fish? Or is yes, it does. All the, okay. all the seafoods. Okay, yeah, perfect. Yeah, they, they, they give it, they, at least the Framingham Heart Study have given it back to them as being fish. Shrimp is fine. So. Okay, Thank you. let's move to Patricia. Oh, yes. Uh, thank you, Chris. Emily, nice talk. Hi, uh, Pat. Yes, hi. So uh, it's a follow-up of Barry's question. So... We know that fish has DHA and EPA, and can can you sort of speculated what else fish may have that is beneficial as saying the um, long chain fatty acids and so forth. Um, however, I want to know about the formulation of DHA EPA supplements that you used. How similar were they to those that are uh, in fish? Um, I think it depends what type of fish and and the and the. Ratio we used was 650 milligrams of EPA and 350 milligrams of DHA. And there are people who think that that maybe not be enough, it was just one gram. Uh, the one study that looked at three grams was the DREAM study, which was looking at dry eyes. And they thought that we didn't give them enough because we, we, we consulted with them. But they went for the maximum dose. They used like three grams. Anything beyond three grams, you get into problems of bleeding disorders. So it's a side effect issue with it. Um, and that was also not significant as well. So we, we don't really mimic what happens in fish and, and different fish, different species and different things are different. There are many other types of fatty acids in the fish other than those two things. So that, that's also, is it, is it the omega-3s or is it something else in fish? I mean, fish has 
you know, lots of B vitamins and a bunch of other things as well. So we just don't know what it is in fish, you know. Right, right. Uh, the other question has to do with Mediterranean diet that has uh, olive oil. Yeah. I looked at the impact of olive oil in AMD progression. So olive oil is, is something that we did gather information on. So the monosaturated fatty acid, if it's higher than the saturated fatty acid is better. So you get, we, we give, we give a, you know, certain points for eating certain things. So absolutely olive oil is up there, but we don't eat as much olive oil as people Europeans do. Our, our olive oil intake is really minuscule compared to what the Europeans use. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on to David. Yeah, my question was about olive oil, so it has been uh, answered. <laughs> Very well, then let's move to Susie. Hi, hi, Dr. Chu, that was a great talk. Um, I, have two, uh, I have two questions. Um, first is in your study where you compared um, group that had lower intake of Mediterranean um, diet components versus like high proportion, like was other like socioeconomic factors or comorbidities like, matched between two groups? So we've actually adjusted for and, and with and without it, but, but there's a high correlation. People with high SES will have a better diet and, and a higher educated. So, so when you adjust for them, they kind of it, it, they over adjusted. So we, we clearly see that there is a difference. Uh, people, uh, and you know, people talk about the food deserts in the areas of the very, very, um, low so, uh, SES um, places. So there clearly is a, is a correlation between them for sure. Okay. And my second question is, um, have you also looked at what food, what food component might be inversely correlated with the incidence of AMD? Inversely related. Um, you, mean, you mean harmful to AMD? Y yeah. Yeah. Hamburgers. So, <laughs> yeah, arachidonic, arachidonic acid, red meat is, is really one of them that, that does look at, Eris, Eris did do that. Eris looked at that more so than we did. Eris data, I didn't look at it sort of combined, but clearly that was one of them. Um, I know that people look at different other types of diets, but we haven't looked further other than, than that. Um, and some of the saturated fat, fatty acids also, and that probably, again, with a lot of eat meaning. And, and, and it's a fish because people who don't eat meat, we actually look at people who eat fish with and without meat. The fish does stand out even with and without the meat as well, too. So. All right, Thank Professor you. Kaiser. Thank you, Dr. Chu, for a wonderful talk. Um, so my question concerns the carotenoid components of the AREDs, too. So um, I, you know, obviously the zeaxanthin and, like, and lutein were included because they might be able to boost macular pigment and that could be protective. But uh, I was kind of wondering what the current thinking on that is now. Do you think that the protective effects are due to macular pigment boosting or a more generalized antioxidant effect coming from the carotenoids? So the macular pigment is interesting. I know Paul Bernstein had measured some of his patients that he had in at Utah, but I think as he says, Utah is a state where many people are supplementing already with, with lutein seems dancing for some reason. Um, so it's hard to know. And, and we haven't got a direct sort of relationship between macro pigment thickness and protective effects. Other people have seen that. Macro pigment seems to be directly affected by the serum level more than anything else. That's a high correlation with the serum level. So I'm not sure it's really the macro pigment itself or whether it's the oxidative, you know, antioxidative aspect of that. I, I couldn't know for sure, but I think we're leaning towards more the, the latter rather than macro pigment itself. But if you speak with macro pigment researchers, they'll think it's that way. So, so we don't really have solid data one way or the other. Just one real quick follow up. If that's true, I mean, is there any talk of including a di more diverse array of carotenoids like astaxanthin or something like that in future? Yeah, astaxanthin has been discussed, and I've only seen a few papers on that. And certainly, um, that certainly could be. Could that be what's in the fish? You know, astrocytes in fish. So is that what's part of that? We we don't really know. So, but thank you for your 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 question. You. All right, Ben. A sharp question because Kathy is waiting. So okay, <laughs> yeah, just a basic question. So you mentioned in early, uh, I think two to five years group, and you say there's no vision change 
it, the patient have normal vision. And I'm not sure whether I got it right. Oh, so, you know, patients could have AMD and have fairly good vision. They could be 20-20 for a long time. Uh, they could have dark adaptation problems. They can't really, they can't see well in the, you know, it, when, the, when, the, when you go from a very bright room to a dark room, it's hard to dark adapt. I mean, the dark adaptation is a rod function. But patients can have pretty good vision. What I, I think you're probably referring to is that last cases that I was showing you, patients, you know, who have geographic atrophy, we follow them through in our study and they all eventually, most of them end up losing vision. That could be a slow process, but what I was showing you there from the five to 10 year that people were losing vision. And once you get geographic atrophy, it is a relentless loss of vision. It's really very difficult to, to halt that. And we have been trying to get different, different um, you know, therapies for it, but we haven't succeeded in that. And even after knee vascularization, we have successful treatment with the anti vegetative therapy, you still might get geographic atrophy afterwards and you still lose vision because of that. So. Okay, Dorota. Um, thank you so much, Emily. This was really wonderful. And uh, I think I have a little bit like a reflection um, and um, a question. So first of all, um, in fish, so, so uh, historically the EPA and DHA has been chosen because this is the, high, the highest level of the, they are the highest level in fish actually um, in, um, in the long chain fat, polyunsaturated fatty acid. And DHA is obviously very abundant in human body. However, as we know, uh, fish has VLC mm -hmm. PUFAS and uh, these, even in the very small amounts, have to be mostly delivered from outside and they're only really partially made in, um, in, uh, in our body. I have actually uh, one um, thing I would like to add is um, I have been asked, and I, I guess you have been asked many times as well, whether um, populations that eat a lot of fish don't have macular degeneration. And uh, one of them is a Japanese uh, population. And I don't know if you are aware of the study that has been done, it's an association study, that actually the Japanese population has AMD, but it's correlating with the low intake of omega-6 fatty acids. So we are bringing here the question of balance between omega-3 mm -hmm. and omega-6. What do you think about that in the future potential study? That's a very interesting, that's a very interesting finding. Because, you know, in, in J Japan, they really don't have much geographic atrophy. They have mostly a polypoidal or some sort of knee vascular form. The GA, a typical GA that we see is extremely rare. And, and also in, in, I think in the Asian population, even in China as well too. So. So it is quite possible that that balance is really quite important. Um, and certainly that can be very, very interesting. I don't know, what about the people in, in, um, uh, in the Scandinavia? They eat a lot of different fish too. Is there something different in their diets as well then too? They eat different types of fish. I mean, they eat fish pickle fish. herrings and things like that. But yes, which are very rich in very long pufas actually. Yes, okay. <laughs> Justin. Justin as Justin Elstra? Yes. Hi, hey. Uh, Emily, nice to finally meet you. I worked with Eric Strauss here at Genentech. Oh, that's um, nice. All right, I miss yeah, Eric. I miss Eric so much. We all so miss much. Eric, yeah. yes. But we obviously follow your work. Um, a question I had regarding uh, the fish diet, which is really striking, is do you think the beneficial aspects are uh, due to enhanced cardiovascular support for the choroid or for the retina? Or rather, do you think it's some anti-inflammatory components in the diet itself, or both potentially? I think it potentially could be both, probably. But yeah. I, I don't know the answer to it to tell you the truth. That's that's the answer. But it's I mean, I could hypothesize it could be both. You know, the, the improved cardiovascular health is really important. And the core the core, core is really important for, for this as part of the thing that goes downhill as well. So if you can prevent it from you know deteriorating, that would be really important. And certainly the anti-inflammatory aspect is what most of my basic science friends tell me. That's one of the main issues, but yes. All right, thank you. Thanks for a great talk. Thank you. All right, so we had a wonderful uh, conversation. Let's move to Tony and to finalize with Kathy. Well, I just wanted to uh, compliment you on your presentation, Emily, and to, to point out to people how important 
this kind of study is. <clears throat> and without the kind of, of, of careful planning that you and your co co investigators have done, we would have gone this 20 years and not gained the information that we need. And we can help patients. That's the good thing. We can help patients with something simple like the Mediterranean diet and errands too. Thank you. No, thank you for your compliments. I'm very blessed to have such great collaborators and we, we, are, we are very blessed that we, we are able to, and, and NIH has supported these long-term studies which are really needed. The clinical trial wasn't as important as the natural history data because I think that really gives a lot more information. I know and I spoke hours with Eric about our natural history study. How are we going to the GA study? How do we go next? And, and it's, it's data that's used by everybody and we talk to everybody about you know, what we've got. So, so we, we've been very fortunate in that sense. And thank you, Tony, very much for pointing that out. All right, Kathy, all yours. I know you were very, very anxious. You're the queen, Kathy, you're the queen. <laughs> Great. No, I think that's you today, Emily. I would certainly <laughs> echo Tony's comments as well. And I have to, you know, I have one question I am going to ask you, but I also have to tell everyone here, I totally, you gave a presentation at Duke and that presentation was made in a steakhouse. And you were talking about these results and at the time, even bringing up the fish, which was pretty funny. <laughs> Not sure what it says about Duke, but it was. <laughs> but I, I would love to um, just get your thoughts a little bit. The 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 uh, association you found of the CFH with the Mediterranean diet, with the Y um, being potentially even in, in increasing the effect of the you know the positive effect. Right. I'd love to hear. You know, so how are you going to follow up on that, and what your thinking might be going on? I'm sure you guys have been talking about that, and some thoughts about that. Well, we, do, we haven't really thought to you, other than maybe it could help us look at the mechanism of how this works in some way. Um, well, Anand and I've been sort of plotting a little bit, doing some, Anand's been doing some animal work and looking to see where things go with diets and stuff. So it'd be kind of interesting, but, but, you know, obviously we'd like to look further and see how patients um, in other populations and see if that really holds true. Uh, you know, I, people in Rotterdam talk about that you eat away your genetic risk. They talk about the fact you can eat away early AMD. Uh, they have less AMD. So maybe it's not just that. Maybe, I mean, when I talked to Carolyn Claver, it's more like all the complex factor agent, even ARMS2 have some effect. We just didn't find that. And, and I think it'd be interesting to see if that really does hold out. And obviously some of the animal studies would be interesting to see if, if there's anything to that at all. Um, and whether, you know, it's unlikely we're going to genotype everybody and put them on certain diets, but, but if we're going to do a study, we'll probably, again, look at the genotypes and see if we can um, find further information on that. But it is very intriguing on that, that it would be, uh, you know, that the protective effect gives you even more protection. And what is it about that, that that's so important? Perhaps you can do some animal models, Kathy, you probably are better than <laughs> We have some ideas, but I also was wondering in that same context, about the increased risk of HDL, that you know, the increased HDLs is an increased risk for AMD. Yeah. Crossing over with this effect with the diet, where you know that's a this is a diet that increases HDLs. So yeah. what you what how that might be interacting? I can I can never configure that out. Why that is a risk factor? That makes makes it really hard for me to understand that. And I wonder whether because you know I mean my ultimate goal I would love to do Kathy is to do a metabolomic. Uh, assessment of all our bloods that we have because we have bloods from you know 2,000 patients and some of them would launch it to no data and see what happens because some of that is I mean Abdiba Hussein and also Annika Dan Hollander has done some work on on that and the lipids come out to be very strong again so there is something to that but it, it's counterintuitive because cardiovascular disease HDL protects it whereas this is harmful for us. So why is that? And I don't I understand. Maybe maybe there's some other other smaller molecules that we're not measuring. And maybe this is a, a, a surrogate marker for something. I don't know. Well, and it also might be the difference between retention of the HDLs and how they change in the back of the eye versus a systemic HDL. And you know that's something we will be trying, we are trying to dive into. So it's a local 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 handle of HDLs different yeah. from the systemic. So that yeah. may be very 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 much true. Yeah. 
Wonderful I mean, talk, Emily. Thanks. I mean, <laughs> Thank I don't you, Kathy. know how, how quickly news spread at NIH, but do you see that uh, Kathy is very special today? <laughs> <laughs> She has her beautiful orchid. She became a distinguished professor, and we all congratulate Yay. her. Thank you. That's a wonderful news. Nice That's and, nice. Uh, that is brother, brother, brother Anand, did you vote for Susie? You're muted. Uh, that's very good. <laughs> that will be then short. <laughs> Anand, you muted, my dear. Anand, can you hear us? He's completely muted. This is very unusual situation for Anand. All right, sorry. No, I, you know, I couldn't speak in front of Kathy and Emily and you, so I, I just sort of muted myself. <laughs> but the question is, did you vote for Susie? I'm, I'm just doing that. I wanted, I didn't want to be distracted by any voting while I'm hearing, to, you know, Emily. Very good. Let's just help things. Susie to be a winner, not a loser, right? No, no, no. I mean. I just opened the website. Perfectly. There is a link. You guys can find it out. It's on the top of the chat. And vote Susie. Thank you so much. I mean, this was spectacular. And congratulations to Kathy. Uh, are you happy Kathy. today, Kathy? Yes.